Uh, welcome everybody uh, to uh, the uh, talk today, which is sponsored, of course, by the Center for Ethnographic Research at the Institute for the Study of Societal Issues, as well as a number of other co-sponsors, the Institute of East Asian Studies, Center for Southeast Asian Studies, and Institute of International Studies, and we thank them for co-sponsoring it. My name is Martin Sanchez Jankowski, and I'm both the director of the Institute as well as chair of the Center for Ethnographic, um, Ethnographic Studies. Um, before we begin our talk and before I announce our speaker for today, I'd like to announce our next event. Um, it will be on November the 12th at 4 p.m. In, uh, uh, and I'm not sure where, if we have a place yet. Do we have a place? It's, the Latinx it's in the Latinx Research Center, which is uh, the Shorb House on the corner of Channing and Bowdy Street. Uh, Michael Mills, uh, who's at the University of Kent, will present a talk entitled, and it's quite provocative, I thought, After Obamageddon, colon, Reflections on the Rise of Right-Wing Doomsday Prepping in 21st Century America. And we have some flyers uh, at the back for that event. Now, uh, before we begin, I'd like you to check your cell phones and make sure they're in the silent mode uh, so that we're not in this close environment uh, disturbed uh, by some uh, ring of some sort. Um, the format for today will be that our speaker will address us for about 45 minutes and that will be followed by a question and answer uh, period. And I, um, as the moderator, will take a list of those who want to ask a question. So raise your hand and I'll put you in the queue and then our speaker uh, will answer in relationship to uh, where you stand in that queue. Now my, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today who is Professor Tanya Murray Lee who is Professor of Anthropology at the University of Toronto. She received her PhD degree in Social Anthropology from Cambridge University She's written extensively. I will mention some of her books. Her books include Land's End, Capitalist Relations on an Indigenous Frontier, Powers of Exclusion, Land Dilemmas in Southeast Asia with uh, Derek Hall and Phil Hirsch, The Will to Improve, Governmentality, Development, and the Practice of Politics. She's written many, many articles. And today, uh, she's going to discuss uh, some work that she's been doing, and the title of her talk is Exploring Plantation Worlds Towards Ethnographic Collaboration. Please join me in welcoming Professor Tanya Murray. So thank you for the introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here and to talk about my um, current ethnographic work. Um, since this is a, an ethnography center, I thought I would take the opportunity to really focus quite a bit on the kind of, you know, the method and some of the uh, peculiar features of this particular uh, research project and hope to get some feedback from you. And I'm really interested to know what questions you have in the Q&A. Like the book is uh, under review right now. We still have time to, you know, time to add to it and to uh, make improvements to it. So I'm really very open to hearing what you think about it. The approach that we took and you know what more you would have needed to know about it in order to really make sense. So um, our theme is the plantation and I'm going to start with uh, two uh, quotations. So my collaborator in this, uh, well, I should have started with this, um, Pujo Smadi from Gajah Mada University, that's Indonesia's, one of its two sort of leading universities in the island of Java. Uh, he's a professor of anthropology there with a training in um, the Netherlands in anthropology. And he and I started this project together. We planned it and carried it out together. And we we're also co-authoring the book. So that's the kind of main element of the collaboration. Um, but to start off with what it means to have kind of two heads on a topic or two different anthropologists engage with a subject matter, um, when I asked Pujo, what is a plantation? This is what he came up with. So this was his definition. A plantation is a giant, an inefficient and lazy giant, but still a giant. 
It takes up a huge amount of space. It's greedy and careless, destroying everything around it. It is human, but you cannot form a normal human relationship with it. It can trample you, eat you, or drain your strength and spit you out when it's finished. It guards its treasure. You cannot tame it or make it go away. You have to live with it. But it's a bit stupid, so if you're clever, you can steal from it. So this was sort of him taking me into you know, what he imagines when he thinks about a plantation. So uh, the first thing I did then, or that we did together, was to kind of Google, like, what does a giant look like? for an Indonesian like is it you know I'm picturing you know Jack and the Beanstalk like a sort of you know Anglo-European kind of giant I'm not even sure if what he has in mind is the same kind of creature so that's the first thing that we should check out and it turned out that uh, with some some differences it was actually a similar figure okay so I came up with a different definition um, a plantation assembles land labor and capital in huge quantities to produce monocrops for a world market it's intrinsically colonial, and this was something which really surprised Pujo. It wasn't something he had really thought about in those terms. But it's intrinsically colonial, I would argue, because it's always based on the assumption that the people on the spot are incapable of efficient production. That's why you have to have a plantation, because whoever's there must be you know, farming poorly. Therefore, they have to be displaced. It installs a planned order in which all aspects of life are taken under control, space, time, flora, fauna, crops, water, chemicals, transport, houses, people, health, education, religion, mentality, you know, you get the sense of a highly regulated environment. It runs on bureaucracy and the deployment of guards. It claims to bring prosperity, but it's continuously at war, both within and without. So there again we stumbled because... What I meant by war, Pujo is, of course, is always thinking, anticipating translation. Like, what word is that going to be in Indonesian when we take our common text and he wants to write it in Indonesian? The, the natural translation of war is prang, which really means kind of armed conflict. It doesn't morph into the more open-ended sense of like a class war or you know an oppositional relationship which was the kind of thing that I had in mind so you can see that you know even in our initial definitions not only did we have two different kind of kinds of lenses on the subject matter but you know translation like is a giant the same thing is a war the same thing do we actually have the same kinds of things in mind even in the words that we use so you can see how fun it was to try to actually um, collaborate on this project so what I want to do now really briefly is just kind of give you a really quick overview of what a, the plantations where we were researching look and feel like, just to get you a little bit into the scene, and then uh, talk in more detail about the organization of our research as a team project and a collaboration. So briefly then, Indonesia's oil palm plantations. Um, so uh, these have been massively expanding. There was a, a plantation sector in colonial Indonesia, mainly confined to the island of Java. At its <coughs> height, it reached about a million hectares of contiguous plantation land, um, initially tobacco, later uh, rubber, eventually oil palm. But in the last decade, it has enormously expanded, and the main crop now is oil palm. So we're talking about a massive new frontier, huge amounts of land being gobbled up by this crop. Currently about 15 million hectares, uh, or still another 10 million not yet developed but already held by corporations, and another 10 million planned by the government. So in total, uh, it could be up to 35 million hectares of this, which is roughly the size of Germany, so of, of continuous plantation land. So that's the kind of phenomenon we're talking about and one reason why we decided that we should study plantations. Um, 15 million people then, I can talk about the number later, but roughly thinking of one person per hectare, if you think about the workers, their families, you know, roughly that many people are living what we call the plantation life. This would include workers, outgrowers, surrounding villages and their families. And so the ethnographic project we set ourselves was to say, well, what is that life? You know, there's 15 million people basically living their lives in, around, under the shadow of a plantation, but we really have no ethnographic studies of what kind of life they're living in these zones. 
Much of the existing research focuses on what's being taken away. So there's a huge literature on land grabbing, on land issues, loss of forest, like orangutan habitat, that, you know, you get a big sense of what's being extracted, the kinds of lives which are being precluded. But what you get very little of from this literature is the kind of life that's being installed, the set of social, political, economic relations that are being installed in these plantation zones alongside the palms, there is a form of life which is taking shape there, um, and we know very little about it. Most of the um, more qualitative work is done by NGOs, and they often do really great work, um, but you know, their purpose is a little bit different in the sense that they're looking for the, I guess, say, the smoking gun, right? I mean, they're looking for the, for the um, key political and contentious issues, whereas we were more interested in the question of the everyday, you know, ordinary plantations in their everyday life, simply because of scale. You know, 50 million people, we should know something about, and in the future, perhaps 30 million people. That's a lot of people living this kind of life, and we wanted, therefore, to bring kind of an ethnographer's eye to that form. So that was our purpose. 50% um, of the products that any of us buy in the supermarket contain palm oil. That's the product. So it's in all kinds of um, manufactured goods, also detergents, um, cosmetics, and a lot of food products. 50% at the average supermarket of the goods do contain it, though usually is a kind of invisible ingredient. But it's a very important industrial oil. Um, however, most of it... Uh, goes to India as an affordable cooking oil. So again, a very banal kind of use. Uh, it's um, basically, you know, as, as India's uh, modest affluence, more people are able to fry their <laughs> food than was the case previously. And uh, palm oil is the cheapest uh, affordable cooking oil for a very large consumer population. Also in Indonesia, where it's just consumed in this form. So where are we? So we're on the island of Kalimantan, uh, basically in this uh, province here, West Kalimantan, right in the center of the island of Borneo. But there's masses of amounts of plantations here throughout Sarawak, Sabah, West Kalimantan, and increasingly in the rest of Kalimantan as well, now also in, Sul in Sulawesi and into Papua. So it's, uh, the frontier is expanding. This is the uh, particular research area, which is kind of roughly here. And this is a map that we, took, we found um, from 1994, which shows that the entire subdistrict uh, had already been divided up between different companies. So you're really dealing with contiguous wall-to-wall -wall plantations. We studied this one and this one. Um, oh, actually, that one is, includes that one and that one. That's like one continuous thing. This is a different company and a different one and a different one. But none of the locals had seen this map. They certainly hadn't seen it in the early 1990s. So the first people here, when the first plantation came, they imagined that they could just shuffle out of the way and they could continue to farm in the surrounding areas. They didn't know that all those areas had already been allocated. So what, to me, the crushing feature of this map is that the white areas are the only residual areas where people can live. Um, so that's what in, um, they use the Dutch term enclave, uh, enclave. Uh, but basically uh, the, the tactic of the plantations is not to evict people, because eviction causes a big fuss, but to do what they call enclaving, which means to leave them with a little bit of land so that they can, for a short while, keep their village centre, maybe keep some of their rubber trees, a few fruit trees, those which are close. Of course, they lose all the rest of their agroforest and um, rubber land. But uh, that's the model. So this, this is a map which, you know, when read in this way, is rather shocking, right? Because the white areas are pretty small. And this area, which is white, is very steep and is also protected forest. So really, it is a saturation of plantations in this zone. Um, that's what a, a plantation zone looks like. Basically, it's the tabula rasa approach. You know, everything is mown down, whatever, um, trees, um, fruit trees, rubber trees, etc. were there before, are swept out of the way. It's very linear. In this case, it's terraced, but it's equally drastic. Um, so this is a sea of palms in which here is a, the mill where the palm fruit is crushed. 
Um, there's one kind of enclave in a sea of palms, which would be the mill or sometimes a little worker housing block, which you might see tucked in in the middle of a sea of palms. Or there's this kind of enclave. So these are people, this is um, an enclave where the palms start directly behind them. So the original settlement is still there, but it's really just a few houses clinging to the bank of the river. And this, which was all their rice and rubber land, is now plantation. So in studying the plantation zone, we were interested in all these different kinds of um, people. So I'll come back to that. So not only the, uh, the kind of what goes on in the plantation core and the enclaves dotted around it, um, also our research question concerned the question of what we called wealth and poverty. That was our original title, producing wealth and poverty. We assumed that some people are doing well here. It's not a disaster for everyone. Um, this is a, a farming family, a transmigrant farming family from Java that had prospered. They had multiple plots, they had bought trucks, they were getting into kind of secondary businesses. Um, and this is a local family who effectively has lost everything. They've lost their land, they're not employed. So really that sort of shows the dimensions of uh, wealth and poverty within one uh, system. This is plantation housing, sorry, it's, it's a bad um, map, but it shows a kind of slightly militaristic design. Um, of uh, identical houses that workers live in. Um, the workers are uh, local women like this. People from those enclaves tend to be hired as casual day labor, especially women, and they do most of the maintenance work on the plantation. And then uh, the people who do the harvesting, which is considered the skilled task, are only men and mostly migrant. So the plantations use a format um, which is very common in plantation studies, which is always uh, preferring migrant workers um, because they're understood to be more focused on the task, more reliable, uh, less likely to take off for two weeks because, you know, granny died upriver and you have to go to the funeral. The kinds of things which could interrupt labor discipline for the people on the spot. Um, so the plantations do prefer... Uh, migrant workers. This guy f is from Java, but there's others from other Indonesian islands. So they're migrants from within Indonesia, Indonesia being a country with a massive labor reserve in every island. So no shortage of people who can be recruited. So here, um, from the worker point of view, you've got two completely separate populations. Local women, mainly Malay and Dayak, living in their home villages and doing casual day labor. And men, migrants from other islands, living in plantation housing and doing the um, harvesting work. So two, two ships in the night, really, in terms of uh, gender, um, work status, and um, official work roles, and also mo means of re remuneration. Uh, obviously, the permanent workers have much better pay and a certain amount of um, work guarantees, which the casual day laborers don't have. Um, these are small holders, so parts of the plantation system involve plots which are allocated to individual households. They're, ta they're planted by the plantation. They look superficially exactly the same as the rest of the plantation. They're you know, lined up in rows in just the same way. But they are allocated to households in two hectare plots and uh, picked up in company trucks and they go to the same mill. So that's another aspect of this system. Uh, we, if, in the book we call them outgrowers, but they are tied to the same plantation system. Um, transportation is a big issue. Mud <laughs> and sunk trucks are a, a common feature of this landscape. Um, hard physical labor, the, the palm, fresh palm fruit weigh 30 kilos. So these guys, often young men, are you know spearing it with a prong and then like throwing it up into the truck. Um, so t it d the, a lot of the tasks are definitely male and you know, favor strong young men. This is the mill, usually guarded. Um, this is one of the most kind of scary pictures really of the plantation because these are old palms that have been injected with the herbicide uh, Roundup to kill them. Um, you can see this is the size of a person. These palms are uh, about 25 years old, so they're now too high to harvest. You know, the harvesting is done with those long poles. It's very, it's all manual, all manual work. 
So they've been injected to kill them, and the new plants are being planted around them. The new palms are being planted in the interstices. So a plantation, once established, is a permanent system. It sort of cannibalizes. Uh, one generation just gives way to the next. And some plantations in Sumatra, oil palm plantations, are in their third generation of planting. So they've been going continuously in the same spot for 60-some um, years, apparently without any sign of ecological collapse. So this is another picture. It was a question of optics. When I saw these palms, I saw them as kind of giant bats, like sad giant bats with drooping wings. But Pluto saw them as zombie soldiers lined up <laughs> in rows, like awaiting their orders. But either way, it's a scary image because what it shows is the, you know, the utter uh, utilitarianism of the, uh, the way that nature has been kind of um, uh, harnessed into uh, a fa basically a factory system. Okay, so now to the kind of how we went about this, the kind of team aspect of the research. So um, this is part of our research team. I think that's actually me. Um, but these are a bunch of students. Here we are on the boat going up river. Um, so um, Pujo has a, his own um, history of uh, running field schools for his students in Java. He has the, you know, the sense that in order to learn the craft of anthropology, you, know, you have to do field work. So he's been running field schools for, um, for decades. Um, but he's always had the frustration of lack of funding to take his students outside Java. So they do things kind of in his immediate back yard. But one of the uh, inducements for him to do this work with me was that I came with some Canadian research funding and we were able to basically expand his field school so that he could take generations of students um, outside Java, in this case, to Kalimantan. Um, so that's something that he's very committed to, and he has his own kind of, his own mechanism for organizing um, field schools. So in, to some extent, we kind of grafted our research onto his existing model, although it became a lot more ambitious. Another reason for um, really favoring a, a, a T model, just to go back to this. Sorry, I should have. Go to this one here. Um, this is a very this is a large area, and we've already described. There's numerous different kinds of people involved in this system. So there are people who this is the state plantation. So there's state plantation workers. There's the administrative people in the core. There's blocks of worker housing. So there's four or five different sites just within the state plantation. Then there's the people in the enclaves and the interstices here and here. And then in the private plantation, again, there's the core, there's the enclave, then there's these people here are the transmigrants, the outgrowers. And then there's these folks further upriver who are still using their own uh, old rice and rubber system. So in order to try to understand the plantation, we felt that we, we wanted to kind of touch on all of these quite different research sites. <coughs> so we, the first month together, we went around and we identified 20 sites. Uh, where we would put students. So we, we basically um, identified different settlements and hamlets of these different types and got the agreement that we would um, place students there. So then in each of these 20 sites, which were really scattered around this arena, we put three students for two months, three years running. So that was basically the sort of student involvement. Um, and so the, the student's task was to be there in their assigned site for the two months, um, take daily field notes. They were um, allowed and encouraged to write up their own research papers on whatever topics uh, appealed to them, many of which were not topics I would have chosen. But that's, I often thought that's a good thing because I tend to be extremely directed. Like I have my topics and my themes. And so it's very easy for a researcher like me to kind of over-determine um, really the findings, uh, but having, you know, setting loose so many students, each of whom took their own notes, had their own experiences, came up with their own analyses on things which struck them as important, was really a way of kind of de um, decentering my eyes, I would say, on the site and kind of expanding um, the, ro the realms of, of possibility. Okay, so... Um, Disperse sites then. Small teams, three students in each site for two months. 
So one of the things that we definitely were able to do was to take advantage of the different gender, age, and linguistic competence. So some of the, a lot of the workers and trans migrants are Javanese, and, and half of our students were Javanese, but not all of them. So for them, the kind of intimacy of being able to speak Javanese was uh, certainly a way in which they got closer to some of the plantation workers. But there was also, you know, the age and gender. So parts of the plantation are a very male world, a young man's world. And there's no way that middle-aged female professors like me are really going to go um, out gambling and, you know, visiting the prostitutes and some of the things that the guys were doing. So the fact that um, they could uh, hang out with other young men of their age, you know, clearly gave insights to aspects of plantation life which just could not have been done by one person. Um, but likewise for the women. So the women in the team, the uh, Indonesian researchers in particular, were able to you know, spend a lot of time you know, with the office staff, with the people living in the uh, main office complex and their daily lives, including their idiosyncrasies, their obsession with status, their consumer patterns, their little jealousies over children and their education and their successes, but really get very close to that kind of intimate uh, plantation world, which, um, you know, writers like Anne Stola talk about the kind of, you know, the affective life of the plantation, but it's not easy to get into that life. But some of these students were able to do that because they just hung out long enough and they stayed with these people and, you know, were incorporated really into some of their activities. Uh, so, and of course, because people uh, in the plantation are often pretty bored with their very limited social world, their closed social world, they were very open to just the fun and the diversity of having new people living there. Um, so the task of the students was to take daily field notes. Definitely, they were of variable quality. Some of them are, I would say, useless, but some of them were very rich, you know, just depending on the diligence of the student and, you know, the kinds of things that they observed. Um, students did their own essays, conducted their own analysis, which from my point of view is most interesting from a kind of meta level, like not really for the content, but like what were the things that struck them as important to write about. And of course, to some extent, these uh, Javanese students are very attracted to the exotic. For them, Kalimantan is the land of headhunters and snakes and magic. And, you know, so they were attracted to exotic themes, the kinds of things I wouldn't have touched with the barge pole, but they were... That's part of what Kalimantan is for Javanese people. And it was important to have that you know, as part of the mosaic here. Right? So um, although I didn't necessarily appreciate all their themes, I do think it was good to kind of let them lose to do what they, uh, what they wanted to do. Um, so Endang is one student who really spent a lot of time with the female office workers. Jonathan was a, part of the Knit. Well, he came with me from Toronto. I don't know if I mentioned that. Um, 10 students per year in this group were from Canada. Um, they weren't necessarily Canadian, this being Toronto. He was actually German. But um, 10 came from the University of Toronto group to join uh, basically Pujo's field school. So he um, decided to make trucking his field site. And he spent two months riding around in those trucks, um, really observing closely you know, the work of um, of the truck drivers, the kinds of negotiations that go on at the mill, whose things get offloaded, who's paying, you know. It was a, a good field site for participant observation. You know, you also used to help skewer those heavy fruit sometimes. Um, but that was his site. This guy, Odit, was, I think, for me, was the most interesting. He's a, he was a, one of the students from Gajamada. He was a master's student. This was his master's project. But he did something which I think no one has done. Um, he worked in the fringe of the plantation where new land was being acquired. And he appointed himself the guy on the back of the motorbike of the guy who was going around um, with a GPS measuring the new plots of land which were being acquired for the plantation. So he was there you know, at the site of measurement also seeing the fabricated and falsified measurements, which were going down a fair bit. And then he stayed, so that was his day job. Um, and then he stayed in the house of the customary leader, who was the main broker of 
the land deals for that site. So he was able to position himself, both in terms of his day job and his kind of night job, um, really in the thick of a land acquisition process and get a kind of density of understanding of how this was going down, which again, I, neither Pujo or I could possibly have done. And it was partly because, you know, he's less threatening. He was a young guy. He's like the sidekick of the guy on the back of the motorbike, right? And no one paid too much attention to him. Um, they should have, though, because he came up with like 200 pages of dense field notes and a very good master's thesis, really explaining for the first time um, the details of how these kinds of land tra transactions actually go on. And James, who was one of my students, um, he, with his little training in anthropology, these are undergraduates, um, he decided to really get into kinship. And so he took the settlement where he lived. It was actually that one that you saw, the enclave, uh, which expands a bit beyond the edges of that picture. And he did a complete kinship mapping of the entire settlement and who was related to whom. And it turned out to be a settlement comp comprised of uh, former plantation workers and from Java and local Malays. But he, he mapped the kinship and he mapped the land holdings. Like that was like a detailed task. It took him two months. He came up with these huge diagrams, which at one stage I actually pasted all the way around the office walls, you know, because it just went on and on and on, right? Um, but again, that, you know, that was a density of research which was really quite remarkable. And, okay, so what did we get from this? I mean, part of, of, of what I, I felt for me as a, you know, this sort of um, team leader was um, seeing Kalamantan through their eyes. And of course, that, that's often awkward because I think, as I mentioned earlier, within Indonesia, there are uh, hierarchies and there's definitely racisms. Um, you know, uh, Dayak people are uh, thought to be backward and violent. Malays are thought to be lazy. Um, you know, there are all kinds of ethnic stereotypes which are just common currency within Indonesia. Um, but they're the kinds of things which, you know, we ethnographers are not really, you know, supposed to um, participate in. But of course, the students were unselfconscious. In, and so their notes often reflect you know, their, um, their understanding of what was going on. So it was part of it. You know, you really, I really felt I got a sense of Indonesia through their, Kalimantan through their eyes, including their disappointments. As they went up the big Kapuas River, because they'd read stories about headhunters, they were expecting to see forest. And all they saw 100 miles up the Kapuas was uh, mines, uh, log rafts, and mines and plantations and absolutely no forest at all. And they were extremely disappointed. But that to me is also kind of data in a sense, right? Because they, you know, their own expectations about the interior of their country are formed by the same kind of distanced mythologies that could be, um, you know, could be transnational, but they also work you know, in internal to the nation, one could say. In some ways, the Indonesian students' takes were more interesting than the Canadians because for the Canadians, everything was new. Um, but for the, uh, for the Indonesians, being kind of middle-class urban Javanese, as most of them were, you know, it was a, a view on Borneo from that location. And the other, some of the things which they, they took it upon themselves to criticize, one of their main criticisms of the natives was that they were, as the Indonesians put it, too consumptive. Like they were very critical of the fact that these people had or aspired to have motorbikes and cell phones, and this seemed to them sort of inappropriate. Somehow they should have been more in tune with nature or, you know, less, um, uh, less enamored of kind of urban and consumer ways. But that's interesting also as an, as an observation on the Javanese, right? You know, what, what they thought was proper to the natives of their own interior. Um, so what were some of the main stresses? Well, the Canadians, some of the students uh, didn't want to, quote, babysit. And because of the limited linguistic comp competence of the Canadian students, whose Indonesian was rudimentary, um, some of them felt that was a burden, like to have to kind of be endlessly translating or escorting. So this is a reality of this kind of uh, field work. And, you know, we can talk some more about it, whether it's sort of worth the effort um, some of, of uh, the Canadian students just, in fact, in particular, Jonathan and James, just did very well with their language learning and managed to uh, get by. They had six weeks of language training at the beginning of this. 
um, and they were able to manage, but others just felt very overwhelmed and really did need to be escorted all the time. Ethics was a big thing. You know, I came bearing our research ethics boards, forms for procedures, and of course, you know, the Indonesian team had never heard of any such thing and had no history or expectation of running around getting people to sign things. And even the idea that you actually had to tell them who you were and what you were doing as like the beginning of any encounter, you know, we're a team of researchers, we're looking at plantation life, like even that was something which took a lot of persuading that that was like a minimal thing that we really had to do. So that's, um, you know, so, what, so what's my role there? I have to bully everybody to conform to a Canadian rule or I have to say Indonesian researchers guided by Pujo do what they do their way and maybe it's not up to me to, you know, impose. So that's, that was a tricky one. The question of how much to kind of direct, uh, you know, how much to direct people's studies and how much to let them do what they wanted to do is also a, a stress. And then question of style. Like some of the students um, thought that hanging out and chilling was their main job, but they actually took no field notes at all. <laughs> and so, you know, this question of what, what you know... It's a different role. It's a different role. <laughs> yes, but persuading some of these young guys who were, who were performing cool and having fun hanging out with the guys, the plantation guys who were performing cool, and no one is actually taking out a notebook. It's like, okay, so at what point um, do you... Um, just withdraw a little bit and write down a few things, right? So, you know, that was, I, and when I suggested that, I was, there's almost some of them accused me of being colonial. It's like telling them what to do. Like, who are you to tell us how we should, how we should do our field work, right? So that's what I mean by differences in style. Um, but this was not uniform. Um, some of them uh, kept excellent field notes with no instruction at all from me. Um, okay, so then now to sort of zero in a bit on the two of us, Pujo and I, the co-investigators. So uh, here he is. This is Pujo, this is me. Um, so right at the beginning, I asked Pujo, uh, like, what did he want out of this? Like, what was the attraction to, to trying to conduct a piece of research like this together? And his, in his words, or I'd known him for about a decade by then, so we did know each other, but we'd never done anything intensive like this together. I asked him what did he want out of this, and he said he wanted to be a proper colleague and a co-researcher, and he didn't want to be the research assistant or the native informant. And so, you know, that in a nutshell had been his experience thus far of foreign researchers, his old Dutch professors, and many others who come to Gajamada, come to Pujo, ask him to collaborate, but actually want a fixer who will set up everything for them, uh, and then uh, maybe attend a conference or something, but they don't really think of him as a collaborator in the analysis. So that was what he wanted, and I said, great, you're on, we're on, let's try. So that was the premise, and that was up front. And that's really what we meant by sort of, can we avoid colonial relations? Can we avoid reproducing a relationship in which the outside researcher, in this case also probably senior to him, you know, more published, more known, blah, 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 um, uh, gets to be the dominant voice. And the Indonesian researcher, whatever, the, w even if the two names are there on a document, everybody thinks they know that really it's my work and his name's just there out of politeness, right? Like that, that was something that we, it's common, you see two names, but what is the nature of the collaboration, right? And I wouldn't say we've done this perfectly, but up front, that was the aim, to see whether we could do this without reproducing that relationship. So we planned the research jointly. Um, I would say he did more of that part. You know, he was the one who located the field sites. He also did a genius thing in terms of getting the research permits, which was something I could never have done. So that's where the research assistant bit, you know, sort of reappears in the sense that he definitely, without working with him, I could not have done any of this. Um, so in terms of the field work itself, we spent um, a couple of months really together, like me on the back of the motorbike, but um, then we usually divided forces. Um, so I focused more on the plantation core. He hated the plantation core. He felt incredibly uncomfortable there. Um, he always preferred the upriver areas where he thought social relations were more normal. I could talk a bit about that later. But so we kind of divided our labors. 
which also meant that we divided the supervision of the students. So I supervised all the downriver people, and he supervised all the upriver people. Um, but because we had spent the first few months together, basically we all knew the same people. So when I would read his field notes, I would know who he was talking about. I would know where he was and who he was talking to. I had also talked to that person. Maybe I wasn't there at that particular conversation, but I had enough of a context and, and vice versa. And also with the students' notes, because we had uh, visited all of their sites um, we knew where they were and who they were talking to. So I think that was you know, a key to being able to make use of each other's uh, field work. Um, different styles to researchers. Pujo's style is very casual. He just, his, his is a chilling style. Like you sit, you drink another cup of coffee or some rice wine, and you wait to see what weird things are going to happen today. Like his idea is that you don't find data, it comes to you. Um, I have a very different <laughs> idea. <laughs> um, and my idea, as Pujo said, people told him, like, Tanya gives us headaches. So apparently, uh, his interpretation was that this was an affectionate um, uh, comment on the fact that I like to sit down and talk to people. And so he, Pujo noticed this, because I wasn't as aware of it, but that I tend to treat my interlocutors as, as equals who have who are knowledgeable, you know, who have their own analysis of the situation in which they're living that I want to hear about. And so if I would show up, um, people knew that, okay, this is going to be serious stuff now. Like, like, let's get out, get the smokes and get another cup of coffee and, you know, let's kind of dig in because it's going to be a workout. You know, we're going to talk about things. She's going to make us think about things. She's going to ask us questions, which we really have to kind of, you know, dig into our memories and think about it. And so luckily, the plantation is full of people who have this capacity and this interest. So that style worked well for me, but it's not really his style. So we really did have very different, arguably complementary styles. If everything had been driven by my agenda, there would have been fewer eruptions of the surprising things which came about because Pujo was just sitting there and something happened. Um, but there you go. Also, I would say informants' expectations of us. People thought of me as somebody who'd come from far away, and so, of course, I would have a serious purpose to my visit. We want to help her, right? She's here far from her family for a reason, so, you know, let's help her get her task done. That was the kind of the approach. And they didn't have that approach to Pujo. So some of the difference in style was actually generated by our interlocutors and what they expected of us. Um, so to some extent, though, these are just... I would say sort of exaggerations, and most of what we did was somewhere in the middle. So writing together is obviously by far the biggest challenge, um, and I think that's where the differences in academic formation, prior reading, um, ethnographic style really come in, and also the anticipated readers. Like I'm anticipating a kind of reader, some of whom might be people in this room. You know, Pujo's thinking of, of other kinds of reader. You know, how is he going to... What is an Indonesian audience going to expect from this? What are the things that he needs to make clear? So that's a challenge, right? We're, to some extent, writing for different audiences. I would say, it, in a weird way, we came together, and also politically, we're quite different. I mean, Pritchard's very conservative, um, but he's a dogged empiricist. So um, as we came out with writing, or especially some of my writing, which was quite critical of the plantation complex, and I often, you know, I always footnote, like, did this work together with Pujo, and I would check in with him and say, well, are you okay? For, you know, are you going to get into trouble? Or, you know, like, are you really up for having your name associated with this work? And he always said, Tanya, he said, if these are the facts, if this is true, then yes, you know, I'm behind it 100%, right? So in, in a sense, the sense the, the, his feeling that we were not making this up, that the things which we were finding, good, bad, and ugly, were the facts, um, was part of what enabled us actually to collaborate, even though I would say our sort of you know political stakes were a little bit different. Um, prior knowledge is obviously a huge thing. Like we both bring to, brought to it quite different um, previous histories, different kinds of writing we had done. To some extent, also different styles of anthropology. Like I came more from a kind of British Marxist kind of position. Uh, you know, he was more of a cultural anthropology. Um, Dutch, 
trained, uh, you know, we've, to some extent, we had different concepts, I would say, in mind, even let alone the fact that one's Canadian and one is Indonesian, we're just kind of different sorts of anthropologists, actually. So what we had decided to do was initially to write separately. We would each write a few articles, which we did, you know, separately and in our own voices for our own audiences, but we would try to write this book together. And uh, the way we had decided to do it was, to, I think, a classic way people try to co-author, which is to divide it up. You know, he would write two chapters, I would write two chapters. And then, uh, you know, based on an outline we had discussed together, then his idea was that I would take and translate his, he was writing in Indonesian, I would sort of translate it and synthesize it and come up with the master text, and he would then translate it back into Indonesian. Mm -hmm. But in the context of doing that, it became mine. Basically, in my translation and rewriting and synthesis, it was my voice at the end of the day, and his disappeared. So I wasn't at all happy with that. He would, I don't think he would have said anything, but I don't think he was very happy with it either. So we decided to scrap it completely and to start again mm. like this. So we sat together <laughs> uh, page by page and actually tried to write it um, together. So, uh, you know, on each point, it's like, so what do we have to say here? Like, you know, what's our data? What's our evidence? Um, what's the point we're trying to make? So um, some of the challenges of this were, you know, like what we had actually what we had actually seen was often quite different. You know, what I had noted, what he was noted, what he thought was, was worthy of comment and I took for granted and vice versa. Um, for example, when we first arrived at the plantation, he, I didn't notice this at all, but he noticed that the coffee stalls by the river were full of men in their uniforms, plantation worker uniforms. And he said, these people are stealing. <coughs> But what he meant was they were stealing time because it was 9.30 and then in their uniforms, there they were like lounging in the coffee stalls. So he wasn't surprised at the stealing because he had seen it before. Um, he had previously studied a uh, tea plantation in Java. So he knew that this was customary in plantations, but the brazenness surprised him. So that you could say is a kind of a subtle form of prior knowledge which he brought to the scene, which made him ask questions about the nature, the differences between stealing in the Javanese plantation and stealing in Kalimantan, and why that such brazen behavior was going on. So that was a whole thing that I, I don't think I would even have got there. I wouldn't have noticed it. I wouldn't have picked up on it in the same way. And there were things the other way around as well. We spent a lot of time kind of rereading field notes together and then, like, what do we make of this? Um, then we would ask each other questions, like, I think we should say something about that, or, like, how is a colonial plantation really different from the contemporary plantation? He would ask this question, and then we would, like, the next half day, here we are, like, trying to kind of pull it out, trying to map it out. So asking each other a question, like the initial one, what is a plantation? Seeing the answers that we gave to it. Um, Again, because we're empiricists, like, do we have any examples? So if we want to say this, but like, where's our evidence? Like, what examples do we have? What can we bring to it? And this was Prujo's favorite, like, let's try. <laughs> Basically, textually, let's try. Like, we have an idea, let's like try it and see. Um, anticipating translation was a huge discipline. I sort of mentioned it earlier, but, you know, because I usually had the keyboard being the English speaker, and we were writing in English at the stage, um, he was always anticipating translation, so he was looking at every sentence from the point of view, if I had composed a sentence that he did not fully, really grasp, how was he going to translate it? Not only how could he own it as an author, but how could he render it? And so that made us go back to every woolly, slippery, <laughs> um, you know, overly um, abstract sentence and revisit it, right? So it imposed a huge discipline on the writing. Um, but also this question of like, you know, the different kinds of ownership that we have in this project, the different kinds of risks that each of us is taking and the, the kinds of uh, stakes that are involved. Like, you know, we can talk more about that. But last point, um, this was actually my first trip with Pujo to a plantation. This is a plantation in Java, um, a tea plantation, where as it turns out, he, he grew up on this plantation. Um, but he also did an ethnographic and historical study there. So he parks his old Jeep and says, come Tanya, come and look at this. And I'm thinking, drainage, <laughs> a drainage ditch, a clay pipe and a drain, why? And he explains that this plantation um, in the 1870s had 
installed pipes to flush coffee berries down from the top of the plantation to the bottom because the level of theft, the cart haulers, um, involving uh, collusion between plantation workers and surrounding villages was so extreme that one of the managers had a, a, a sort of idea that if you could just encapsulate them all in a pipe and flush them down from top to bottom, you could prevent this kind of theft. So that's what I mean by prior knowledge. Like, you know, Puja, in a way, was sort of primed to think about a plantation being at war with its workers and the surrounding villages. I think I would have got there eventually but maybe not in quite the way that we did because of you know, something that he brought to it. And on other topics, I oh, probably brought something too. But anyway, so that's kind of what we did. Those are the challenges, and I'd be very, very interested to hear your questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you. I'll do my best to uh, get everybody who wants to ask a question. So just uh, keep your hand up until I uh, nod to you that I've got it. I, I, I read a book about Papua New Guinea and Papua New Guinea communities, mm -hmm. but also the village life. And I was interested uh, in the international zone, particularly, do they speak a patois, or a, I don't know if that's the right way to pronounce the French word, a, a, a jargon, a modified language, which is sort of accommodating the different uh, ethnic uh, populations of workers. And, and does that, do they use a master's talk, which is what the Papua New Guinea people talk about, uh, the language that's adopted at certain mining camps or mining, uh, big mining, these big mining facilities or big logging camps, where it's a sort of a, a baby talk with a little bit of English, but local grammar, it's kind of a linguistic construction. Do they have a special language on these industrial farms? Um, and does that, does, is that an, a way to minimize problems if you're doing transactions, like if you're, if you're going to get some service, like a buying something or buying food or buying clothes or buying, does that minimize the tensions between a local hosting population and the, the migrant workforce, mm -hmm. the male migrant workforce? I was just wondering about those things. I'm, I know that's a concern in mining communities and I don't know if that applies. If mining communities, and what's mining communities are like, it's say in Papua New Guinea or the Solomon Islands, if it's similar, it, it, it's a social you know, organism as working on a big, uh, palm oil plantation. Um, so there's no international zone because the you know the managers here are all Indonesian. Um, they're often Indonesian from other islands. And many of them are Batak. Some of them are Javanese. Um, they all speak Indonesian, which is the national language. The de facto lingua franca among workers on the state plantation was Javanese because they were the majority and they would speak Javanese among themselves and some of the Dayak and Malay workers and Batak workers also understood Javanese. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the majority language within the plantation had, was also playing a role. But the default is, that's always available is Indonesian. So unlike in some of my other previous work where I was working with quite isolated people who don't speak Indonesian, um, anyone in a plantation zone does speak Indonesian because it, it is the lingua franca. They've all minimally been to primary school. Um, so uh, so that, that kind of contact zone issue that you're describing is actually quite different, I would say. Um, you know, linguistically, that's not quite the problem. Um, the issue is really more one of status. You know, the extent to which... Uh, plantation managers and to some extent on the uh, plantation workers thought of themselves as superior to the local population. And that's, uh, you know, in colonial times that was a racial divide. You know, it was white uh, plantation managers and uh, Indonesian, mainly Javanese workers. Now it's morphed. They're all Indonesian, um, but that line is still there. So um, many of the plantation managers now are Batak from Sumatra, some of them are Javanese, but they all, I would say to a man, thought that the local Malays and Dayaks were lazy and good for nothing. And that's the reason that sort of justified the plantation premise. So in that sense, what I call the colonial assumption is alive and well in the plantation today. Because for these uh, workers who are um, uh, running these plantations, why else are they there? If not, you know, if the locals could do it, they would have done it. Like clearly, the locals are not capable. Therefore, 
Um, you know, we need the expertise of these uh, skilled plantation managers. We need the diligence of the Javanese plantation workers. So a kind of an ethnic um, hierarchy was the issue, not so much linguistic. And not in any straightforward way racial, although it operated, uh, there were some sharp boundaries for sure. Yeah. Yes, sir. thanks for the talk. Um, I was curious if you could talk a little bit about how the um, data from the field school, mm -hmm. the student data, made its way or didn't make its way into the uh, book and what the relationship was there, and if you view that aspect as being valuable in the overall um, product. Right, so of course it's huge, right? I mean, the database is yeah. enormous, like yeah. more than we could even read at yeah. times. <laughs> so practically speaking, what has happened is that I would say probably the 10 best, you know, the students who were in what I considered to be really strategic locations or who did really good field work and had excellent field notes, like I know my way around their field notes very well and they've made them they've made their way into my thinking and those students will be acknowledged for their field work. Um, the other students' work has not directly entered. You know, there, there was there was too much, some of it was of quite low quality or it duplicated things that I already knew. Do so it'll be patchy. Do you bring in those like meta aspects you were talking about, about like trends within the questions that we're asking? Does that make it into the book too? Or uh, only in the preface at this point. Okay. Yeah. Um, where I talk about arrival narratives, you know, and the classic in, in anthropology is the arrival narrative. But what was interesting here was that we had 100 people's arrival narratives. The, all the Indonesian students and the Canadian students, they're all giving us, and you know, field notes are most detailed the first three days, <laughs> the arrival, <laughs> note, the arrival <laughs> narrative is like super thick and then it thins out, right? Um, but we have a lot of that, you know, yeah. their initial impressions. So, um, so that I do comment on, or we do comment on in the preface. But I mean, that multivocality is a problem throughout, right? And um, you know, we had a workshop this morning so talking about this. To actually maintain a writing style in which the different student contributions, or even Pujo and my contributions, remain distinct as opposed to they have contributed to the picture that we now present. But apart from that initial definition, his definition of what is a plantation and mine, we don't systematically say, this is him, this is me, this is him, this is me, right? Um, because ultimately, we didn't sustain distinct positions. You know, we talked it through. Um, yeah. So, of course, I have lots and lots of questions, but um, I'll restrict it to two. Um, uh, I guess I was a little surprised since Pujo's been the, been the uh, chair of that anthropology department mm -hmm. at the field school for a while, that he didn't have some training for people in how to write field notes. You'd think if you're going off, that's one of the things that they'd have to learn. So I, I'm, I, I ask this in a completely friendly way because I'm trying to do a similar kind of project mm -hmm. with lots of people doing ethnographic research in the field. And we have 16 people who go back every year for four months. And, mm. um, you know, that's a lot of notes. Yeah. And so what we did is develop templates mm. um, so we know something about what each thing is. So I'm just wondering if he didn't have some kind of system around that, if you could say something about that, um, or if he decided just not to use it. And then the other thing was, um, I was wondering how you decided, um, and maybe I just I got the wrong impression, but, but you keep talking about the plantation. Mm -hmm. And yet the map that you showed us, there's the, there's the state plantation, there's the private plantation, there's the place where there's outgrowers, there's places where there's only workers, and the central plantation, there, and, and they're all different companies. So, I know. I mean, was that a strategy uh, mm -hmm. to, to do that? Um, and did, if I know you were focusing mostly on uh, people's lives and, and their experiences, so did that kind of not, those differences in the organization of the plantation not translate into people's everyday lives? And stuff? Okay, so in terms of the field notes, um, I would say that Prudeau, um, he of course he talked to them a lot about, you know, if there's nothing in your field notes, like it's of no use to anyone, you know, he, but he's not very, uh, <laughs> he's not, very tough on discipline plus the team was too big mm -hmm. and it kept growing initially it was supposed to be 10 Canadians and like 20 Indonesians but and then at one stage it was like 80 because he at people once. at once because he kept adding people um, and that's because uh, it was a big point of attraction for them and so you know he 
he was also cognizant of the fact that this was an opportunity for many uh, Indonesians who never get anywhere close to a plantation to do this kind of research. So I understood his kind of accretion of more and more and more people, but it did mean that control and discipline, <laughs> uh, you know, declined uh, correspondingly. So, um, of course, we did uh, like four or five day training workshop before the field school took off. Um, which made a huge dent on some people and very little on others. So that's how it was. Um, in terms of the plantation, yes. Now, in the, in the text, you'll see that definitely the difference between the state and the private plantation, between core and outgrowers and surrounding villages is very clear. So we haven't sort of glommed that all into one kind of plantation life. In fact, part of our premise in the team project is that these are really very distinct forms of life within this larger plantation mosaic and that's one reason why we needed a team who's going to really get into the upriver who's going to really get into the transmigration zone who's going to be in the core of the state plantation etc so you know that that's not um mushed. that that should come across quite clearly yeah yes this is super interesting thank you um one question i had is that you mentioned that the um, staff were open to the researchers Mm, yeah, okay, we'll come back to that. <laughs> okay, well, I was just wondering about the owners in terms of the private one and the you know, top administrators in terms of the government one. It seems like they would maybe be less open, and I'm wondering if them viewing it as a, or you presenting it as a field school, maybe did that help with gaining access um, mm -hmm. that you might not have gotten before? Okay, thank you. So uh, the state plantation was the one where Puja got permission, and he did it in a classic Indonesian way, um, one government official to another. As an employee of, his, of a state university, Gajamada, he wrote to the head of the National Plantation Corporation and said, I require access for purposes of research. And the guy said, yes. So we got permission for access to the state plantation. When we then arrived at the plantation door and showed the manager this letter of permission from his super boss, he was appalled mm. that we actually had permission to be there and he couldn't do anything about it, hierarchy being what it is, right? So, so that was a genius thing that you know, Puja managed to just use the system and uh, for, for the purpose of our scientific inquiry. You know. So the assumption for, is what... What, what the plantations have had some experience of is researchers who come, uh, spent a couple of days in the office rifling through a few rat-eaten reports and go. So what they didn't understand was that we were going to stick around for months and that we would you know, really be there. The other thing that Pujo had in his letter of permission was that we were it was for Pujo and his team, open-ended, until they are done which meant multi-year as far as we were concerned. Like, we're not done yet, right? We're still going back. So um, he got a very uh, a unusual form of permission, um, which definitely the managers on the spot found completely terrifying. The workers, on the other hand, not so much, right? Because for them, it was entertainment. So another aspect of the team is that you know, in a very hierarchical system like that, you can't simultaneously be hobnobbing with top managers and with workers because... They won't trust you. But if you have a team, you can be doing different things, right? So some team members are really getting very close and hanging out in the office and, you know, acting as kind of members of that uh, community. And others are out in the um, subdivisions, staying with the field hands and in a different world. So that was uh, one way of sort of modifying that hierarchy, but also getting access. Uh, workers in general were, were fine with our presence. With the private plantation, we never had permission. It would not have been possible. But because it's a much less closed world, and because most of the workers at that plantation live in the surrounding villages where we could meet them in their homes, so our mode of access there was more through kinship networks. So some people that Puja met initially and then their cousins and their neighbors, and it was more of a sort of an organic networking approach. Some of our key informants there who were managers um, spoke to us out of helpfulness at the beginning, but always with a bit of a watchful eye to betraying kind of company secrets. 
Um, but they didn't think they were doing anything wrong. So, But then some of them left the company and became more open subsequently. So over a multi-year venture, as people's positions change, different doors open up. And another door closed. So one of the people who was a critic of the plantation, he was a plantation guard, another of these organic intellectuals. At the beginning, he was a labor organizer, and, and then he became a company man. You know, he went up in the hierarchy, and in my later interviews with him, it was entirely closed. So people's relationship to us shifted also over time. Um, yeah. So the fact that it was a field school, no, I don't think it was that, because it, we never presented it actually as a field school, but as a team. This was a research team. Um, so the fact that in Prudhoe's books, it was a continuation of his field school tradition, kind of morphed into this idea that we had a research team which included students. I actually was going to ask the same question as Michael asked, so you already answered it. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, I, was, uh, uh, I was interested in this constraint of translation. Yes. And how often in analysis and anthropology, there's a reliance on this turn of phrase or, mm. as you said, woolly language. And you had to go through this process and of maybe making the ideas more concrete or mm -hmm. uh, fitting through all that for translation. Mm -hmm. So how, what were some of the, like, the benefits or things that were lost that could even benefit other anthropologists in their writing or that are not even considering translation but could benefit from considering these type of constraints? You mean some examples or? Yeah, like what, what you felt was kind of maybe lost in that mm. type of process, if it was just going to be in English or um, what was gained because you yeah. had to think through the translation process. You know, I've had previous experience of co-authoring, and what I find is that it imposes a huge discipline on clarity mm -hmm. because you cannot carry your co-authors with you regardless of language if you're not really on the same page. So if you're, if you're you know, if I, can't, if I don't know what you mean by a sentence, um, I'm going to challenge you because I can't have my name as a co-author on that sentence that I can't make any sense of, right? So I think if you do co-authorship sort of diligently and line by line, um, it does lead to a kind of clarity in the writing which is unusual, like nothing slips by because it can't really. And because the fact that it's then going to be translated in, into a different language ups the ante further. Um, so I don't know that there are losses. I mean, you, you know, what, one of the issues here is, you know, theory. You know, Pujo doesn't read the kinds of things that I read. Um, but I think that we work around that. Right? You know, the ideas that I felt it was really important to introduce into the book, you know, I explained to him. He could get it. If he couldn't get it, we couldn't use it. So, you know, um, you know, we, we do have our different strengths, but I, I think we intend this to be an ethnographically driven book. So from that point of view, that becomes less of a problem. I'm not trying to explain Foucault to Pujo. It's not necessary. Not that he couldn't get it. Of course he could. He's a very intelligent guy, but it's like it's not his game and, it, and it's not his investment and it's not what he needs to be doing right now. And so, you know, we don't have to do that. Uh, it's not essential for this project. So would you say that's a loss? I, I don't think it's really a loss. You know, it's a, it's a different game. Right, I mean, so we haven't been in this site for decades. Like, you know, Pujo had previous research on plantations, uh, which he drew on. I have 20 years of work in Indonesia uh, in different agrarian environments, but not in plantations. So both, both of us had a lot of prior experience. But I would say for this project, it was sort of important that the site was new to both of us. I mean, Nancy has some experience of this. It's like if you want to 
is really your place and you know the drill and you're including someone like that doesn't work so well like in some sense it was kind of a leveling because we were both new to this place we brought our separate you know prior history and expertise to it in terms of disagreement it's going to sound strange but ultimately i don't think we really disagreed on anything you know but 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 a lot of things we ended up digging into because one or the other of us questioned them. Um, so, uh, so for example, on this question of war, like Puja was never com comfortable with it because in Indonesia that su suggests kind of like armed conflict. He's thinking, Prang, not really. So we ended up having a lot of discussion about what was meant by that term. Was it the right term? I'm still not sure that it is the right term. Are there are there other ways of coming at the topic? So there are a few things which are actually quite key conceptual things which haven't quite resolved. Not exactly disagreements, because I think we have a common sense of what's happening here, but the question is what's the best way to express it and explain it that won't send the readers off on a wrong tangent or give them the wrong impression about something. Something else which we, you know, because we were trying to write a short book, <laughs> So far, we've been quite successful. Um, there's uh, tons of things are left out. So this issue of kind of prioritizing um, and being sort of very vigilant about, you know, many things could be said here, but what are the key things that we want to say? Um, he, I think he, he, what he really, you know, I, I don't like to speak for him, but what he has said to me directly is that uh, he had never analyzed data like this before, like this kind of painstaking business of trying to kind of make sense out of things. And he sometimes said that he, he was there too and he didn't get half of what I got. So some of what I was bringing to it, perhaps because of my prior training, my prior style of analysis, he felt pushed him. And I would say vice versa too. Like some of the things we got into are not things I would have got into without his product. Now, whether it's you know exactly equal, I don't think we need to kind of, you know, do a kind of calculus. But I would say that both of so it's not that we disagreed; it's that we came from slightly different angles, emphasized different things, had to work out whether that that was important or not. You know, did we have to flag it? Yeah. Could I ask uh, if there's no? <laughs> could I guess just ask one question? It's a it's a methods question. It's a validity question. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose it has both external and internal validity issues. And um, the first one is just the concept of plantation. Mm -hmm. And I, I, when I was listening to you, uh, I really wondered whether really that was the correct word uh, for what you were really studying. Mm -hmm. Because uh, there's a real difference between, uh, first of all, I would say that I wouldn't say that the term is colonial since it starts in many of the Western European countries and mm -hmm. the word itself comes from England. Mm -hmm. um, so I wouldn't say it's that. So it's a mode of economics. And if it was in its, in its form, beginning form, quite feudal, and in the United States and some of the others, family oriented. And what you seem to be studying is something that's, that is uh, a now a very large, could be even international company that owns this land. And the idea that there are the exact same kind of economic thing going on seems to me to be, um, well, it, it seems to be challenging. Um, and if, 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 if I'm right about that, that is, and you want to actually still define it, operationalize it as a, as a plantation, as opposed to what I would call a very large uh, company, international company, perhaps even national company, uh, corporate, I guess I would say, then the de definition has to be, the external uh, validity issue is why what you want to define is different than what's normally defined, and is it carried out in the analysis consistently for internal Mm -hmm. Particularly when you see variation. In other words, if you see no variation, then uh, you know, you know I'm suspect of any kind of studies of no variation. Mm -hmm. 
but if you see variation in you know, how you account for this, given an, an operationalization of the concept. Basically. Right, okay, so thanks, that's a good provocation. So, um, uh, you know, this definition that I gave, um, a plantation assembles land, labor, and capital in huge quantities to produce monocrops for world markets. So that's part of the definition that we are giving it. It's intrinsically colonial in the sense that it's based on the assumption that people on the spot are incapable of efficient production. I would say feudal plantations had this character as yeah. well, right? They imposed a kind of a muscular farming system because the local forms of farming that preceded it were understood to be less efficient and less productive. So that needs some unpacking, you know, what that means. Um, it installs a planned order in which all of these elements are taken under um, control. So I, I would say, so this is my attempt at saying I, this is what I think a plantation is. It runs on bureaucracy. Uh, I would say even a family-run plantation Classically, it's going to have its hierarchies, its role descriptions, um, you know, its overseers and guards, um, and the deployment of guards. Uh, so this, it claims to bring prosperity. Now, that actually is more specific, right? Because I would say that the, maybe that I should cut that, you know, in the sense that the colonial version in Indonesia, the colonial plantations actually never really made this claim. Um, that they were bringing prosperity to the local population, that just wasn't their game. That's what the current ones mm -hmm. are doing. So that is anachronistic, and thank you for pointing it out. Mm -hmm. But I think this element, you know, um, you know, maybe holds. So the way we try to handle this in the book, and uh, it may or may not satisfy you, is by using a kind of an idea of an assemblage and saying, well, a plantation is going to bring together um, a crop, land, labor, capital, a market, you know, uh, the question of what the specific crops are, how labor is recruited, um, how capital uh, is sourced, what's the nature of the market, like all of those things can be variable, but minimally those elements will be present. And then the interesting question for a kind of comparative study is, well, what are the elements and how do they in fact uh, come together? So on what, uh, for, so for example, you know, Plantations could differ enormously in the legal and institutional structure that enables land to be brought in relation with capital, in relation with labor, for example. A relation would have to be forged, but the institutional and legal and political terms of that forging could be very different in different contexts. So we've attempted to use this assemblage idea, like it's an assemblage of elements, links between these elements have to be forged, the resulting beast may look quite different in different places, but it will have a, a sufficient family resemblance that when one would still call it a plantation. Now, where I would put the edge on that would be, for example, like the massive soy farms of um, Brazil right now, you know, where you can have 100,000 hectares and not even any workers, just a guy controlling tractors with his GPS. If you excise labor entirely or you know, almost entirely, would you call that a plantation or would you call that a large mechanized farm? Right? So if you think that the presence of kind of laboring bodies is, do you, and then it's a question of what word do you want to call it? Right? I've, if, do you want to call it a plantation or, or do you, you know, so that really that's just a question of specifying what you want to mean by the term plantation. Yeah, I don't know that I would disagree. I, I'm not interested in whether mm -hmm. I disagree with the analysis. Yeah. But I am worried about whether the term itself can be analytically imposed on what could be two really quite different economic entities. Yeah. That something that we recognize mm -hmm. in its older form that you've described. Yeah. And something in yeah. a very new form yeah. which isn't really right. is something new. That, yes. and that's all yeah. I, that's all I yeah, so I've, I've um, and I think it's going to come up a lot, right? Because I think when an American audience hears the term plantation, they're thinking the South, they're thinking a slave plantation, and that for them is like the the iconic plantation. But for Pujo, that's not nowhere in his horizon. He's, when he hears the words plantation, he's thinking 
Sumatra in the 1870s, Dava in the 1870s. He's not thinking American slavery. He's thinking about an entirely different history. So, you know, I have to also be mindful of what is the plantation for him, right? It, it, I can't just say, right. because Americans are going to read this and they're thinking something else, we have to foreground. I mean, we could acknowledge that other thing, but it's not necessarily going to be like the master term. Well, yeah. she's over her time. Fine with me. Yeah, so I, I saw that your yeah. your yeah. hand. You could, uh, you know, know what? We must thank her. Okay. Uh, okay. And then you can have a very good time. Okay, thank you. Yeah. 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 I just think one of the things that's interesting about it is the translation of this term, mm -hmm. and I agree with what you're saying, but at the same time, in Southeast Asia, actually, there was a lot of planters and plantations and that could be more on a family line or a smaller scale. You know, like they would talk about Chinese planters or British planters or Dutch planters. 